My name is Zafar Sayed. Uh, I serve as the uh, Associate Director for Educational Technology at the McPherson Institute here at McMaster University. It's, uh, it's always best to begin um, with giving thanks for the countless uh, bounties and blessings that we've all been given. Um, given the pace of life and the complexities of life, I think it's always a good idea to uh, keep in mind the sense of gratitude and the bigger picture as we go through life's journey. I also want to acknowledge that uh, we're on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and the Haudenosaunee nations. It's uh, absolutely fantastic that we have a, a room full of people ready to get started talking about learning technology. I think you're going to be really uh, happy with the kind of program that we've been able to put together. Had a chance to look at it. it it's a really a diverse offering of all the different kinds of elements uh, that you would want to engage in conversations around learning technology. Uh, I wanted to take a, a few minutes just to walk you through some of the logistics. This room will serve as our main gathering place, if you will. Uh, we're going to be here for the most part of the, the day uh, this morning. And after lunch, we'll have some concurrent sessions. Come back here in the afternoon as well. Tomorrow, we're going to start right into our concurrent session blocks in the morning, reassemble here in the middle of the day. We're going to have David Porter from eCampus Ontario come and give us a talk. We'll have lunch here again tomorrow. And then there are two more blocks of concurrent sessions uh, located in this building and across the, the, uh, the way at Mills Library. Um, if you need any directions or have some questions, uh, look for the name tags with the little star. Uh, that's the organizing committee, because they are stars. Um, ask them uh, the questions that you need to ask around directions and program and whatever, uh, and they'll walk you through. The, the theme uh, for this event is communities in conversation. And I really hope that we will have that kind of atmosphere here. We've built right into the program opportunities for all of us to come together and engage in conversation, engage in dialogue, to talk about experiences, share practices, um, and you know, sort of review some of the challenges that we have around learning technology. Uh, did want to mention uh, that you know, it's a conference around technology, so what would that be without a hashtag? We do have a hashtag. Uh, it's LTS2016, so if you're tweeting, um, do want to uh, have you tweet out uh, using that hashtag, if you will. We are also uh, live streaming this opening session this morning. Um, you will be able to uh, um, hear or, 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 or see this whole presentation again, if you so choose. Um, that's also available. If you're wanting to get on to the internet, on the back of your um, name badges is the access and directions for getting on online. We, uh, we feel that there's a lot of knowledge and expertise right here in the room, so I, I really invite you in this next two days to engage each other uh, in conversations. Um, make connections, renew connections, um, and hopefully we'll continue the dialogue as we move forward and it's not going to end with these two days that we will be able to take forward some of the uh, discussions and maybe some projects as we move forward. We're really happy to include uh, this time around in this event uh, our colleagues from uh, Mohawk and Sheridan Colleges, so welcome to you and welcome also to our visitors from Brazil. Hola. <laughs> I wanted to get into this whole Portuguese thing right now, but I don't think I'll do that. Um, so with that said, I think it's time to get things started. I wanted to invite our uh, AVP Teaching and Learning, uh, Director of the McPherson Institute, Arshad Ahmed, to come up and introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Arshad. Thank you very much, Zafar, and good morning to everyone. Bono dia. Buongiorno. Good morning, welcome, you are most welcome. Um, I'd like to uh, preface my introduction of our distinguished speaker this morning by first talking just a little bit about one of the most important innovators in the history of learning technologies. Happens to be a man who most of you have likely never heard of. So, James Pillens. 
He was a geography teacher, and he was frustrated by the dominant learning technology that was commonly used in his classroom. James felt that this technology was actually isolating students. It served as a barrier to group interaction and engagement and made the learning environment less democratic and dynamic. And this is what propelled him to become an inventor. He became an inventor by inventing the chalkboard. Yes, James Pillins, the headmaster and geography teacher at the old high school in Edinburgh, Scotland, was the first teacher to look at the tiny slates that were in the hands of each of the students and thought, quote, I should get a really big one of those things and hang it on the wall where all of my students can see the work, unquote. And this was 1801. And the revolution Mr. Pillen started then continues, of course, today in our whiteboards, our white walls, our smart boards, and even on our online chats. Now, I share this story of James Pillens and the origin of the chalkboard for two reasons. One of them, of course, is to inspire you by pointing out how close the next great breakthrough in teaching and learning technology could be. So just imagine. Second, I'd like to remind you that no matter how exciting the technologies part of our symposium may be, learning technologies from the chalkboard to the iPad are just tools whose power and leverage is derived from the great design thinking that comes around these tools, the great teaching that occurs, and mostly from the engagement we have from our students. So it's really the human element that is the secret sauce for any innovation to succeed, and today that secret sauce is going to be you. And so it's really a pleasure to host you and thank you for joining us today to connect your project ideas with colleagues, to exchange good practice, and to link students, staff, and faculty, not just at McMaster, but as Zephyr mentioned, for the first time from our neighbors, we have a Mohawk College, Sheridan College, I think also Brock University, and a few others, and, and few others from faraway places as well. Uh, from Comang, which represents the Brazilian Association of Universities. So, welcome all of you. Uh, this symposium, and it's being led by uh, Zafar and his team, uh, sets out these two ambitious days of offering something like 40 different speakers, presenters, and facilitators. And I can think of no better place than to begin with this morning's keynote. Barbara Oakley is a professor of engineering at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan. She is a visiting scholar at the University of California, San Diego, and she is Coursera's inaugural innovation instructor. Um, her work, which the Wall Street Journal has described as revolutionary, focuses on the complex relationship between neuroscience and social behavior. She co-teaches the Coursera UC San Diego Massive Open Online course, which is called Learning How to Learn, which is the world's most popular Massive Open Online course. Her book, A Mind for Numbers, How to Excel at Math and Science, Even if You Flunked Algebra, is a bestseller. And so with these credentials, you might imagine that Barbara has spent her life with her nose in books. I can assure you this is not the case. Barbara rose to the rank of captain in the US Army and was recognized as a distinguished military scholar. She also worked as a communications expert at the South Pole Station in, Antarct in Antarctica. And she has served as a Russian translator on board Soviet trawlers on the Bering Sea. Barbara was recognized as a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering and is a winner of the American Society of Engineering Education's Chester F. Carlson Award for Technical Innovation in Engineering Education. So you can understand why we are so deeply honored to welcome her to McMaster and to the Learning Technologies Symposium. Please put your hands together 
and welcome Dr. Barbara Oakley. <laughs> So, Arshad and Zafar, I'm so pleased to be invited by you here. It was a pleasure. We met last, what, um, almost a year ago in, uh, in The Hague. And I can assure you that they were at the Coursera conference and they are always on the top of the latest cutting edge innovation in what's going on with learning. So, I'd like to begin. I, I have to share a little secret. I just love to watch people. I just love it, right? So I have to tell you about one of the most interesting people I've ever watched in my life. This guy, he was just, this was when I was working down in Antarctica at McMurdo Station. So down at the bottom of the world, very cold. And this guy, his name was Neil. And he was just this little guy. It was, had a wispy little voice and he was thin and kind of small. He had a big head, so he looked like this sort of upside down exclamation point. And, and, and what Neil used to love to do was, Neil was the best mimic I have ever met in my life. I mean, he could mimic almost anybody. And what he used to love to do, we had this station manager there who was this gigantic hulk of a man. His name was Art Brown. And Art had a deep baritone voice, right? So what Neil, the little guy, used to do is when the phone would ring on the station, he'd pick it up and he'd say, Hello, this is Art Brown speaking in a perfect imitation of Art Brown's voice. So one day, phone rings, Neil picks it up. Hello, this is Art Brown speaking. And it was Art Brown on the other end of the line. <clears throat> so, so, Neil, uh, so, so Art says, who the hell is this? Or words to that effect. And Neil says, why Art, this is you. <laughs> I'm so glad you've finally gotten in touch with yourself. <laughs> and so that's actually what we're going to be doing here today, is we're going to be helping you to get in touch with yourselves and one of the deepest aspects you have as a human being, and that is your ability to learn. And so with that, I probably should give you just a little bit more insight into my own background. I grew up moving all over the United States. So by the time I was about 15 years old, I lived in 10 different places. Now the thing is, if you, math is a very sequential subject. And if you fall off anywhere along the way, it's really hard to get back on. So when I was moving from here in uh, Lubbock, Texas, to Chelmsford, Massachusetts, and I was about seven years old. Suddenly, they were way ahead of me in the multiplication tables. Like, you know, I, I, I just, I couldn't do it. I mean, I wasn't really fast in math anyway, and then suddenly they're way ahead of me, and I couldn't catch up. Well, I realized then that I just could not do math, and also I couldn't do science, and so I essentially flunked my way through elementary, middle, and high school math and science, and it's, it's kind of ironic because I'm standing here in front of you today as a professor of engineering. And, I, and I'm the real deal, I, I, actually, I publish in top journals, I, I, I do good work as an engineer, and one day, so one of my students one day found out about my secret sad past as a math flunky and he asked me, he said, how did you do it? How did you change your brain and suddenly be able to, to learn math and science? And I thought about it and I, I mean, here I was, th this is like, this is the last cute picture of me. So. <laughs> So here I was, I was this little girl and I just loved animals and I liked knitting and I, I always, I grew up in a resolutely monolingual household and you could guess what language I spoke and I always thought, wouldn't it be awesome if I could learn a different language? Well, I didn't have, at that time there weren't college loans available and so I couldn't afford to go to the university and study a different language, so I thought, how can I do it? I realized there was one way I could learn another language, I could actually get paid for it, and that was to join the army. So that's me, 
I'm about to throw a grenade and so that's why I'm looking really nervous and if you knew how clumsy I am you'd know why I was so incredibly nervous but anyway I did learn another language I learned Russian and I uh, just picked that language at whim and so I ended up working out on Soviet trawlers up in the Bering Sea that's me standing on a bunch of fish there I just loved having seen the world through new perspectives and having new adventures so I also ended up uh, at the South Pole Station in Antarctica that's me standing there and that's where I met my husband so I always say I had to go to the end of the earth to meet that man <laughs> uh, and there he is right in the corner of the room so uh, I it, it, he's he's the man behind the success so uh, that's I'm very uh, very very lucky and so at any rate I began to realize something though so I was 26 years old I was about to get out of the military and my sole professional expertise was the ability to speak Russian and you know what there is not a lot of call for people who speak Russian in the world I, I remember looking at the 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 textbooks of the West Point engineers who I worked with in the military and I, I'd look at the textbooks and I go wow it looks like a foreign language <laughs> and, and I begin to wonder uh, now wait a minute aren't I supposed to be open to new perspectives and to having new adventures aren't I supposed to be open intellectually so at age 26 I began to consider the idea of what if I could retrain my brain and actually learn math and science. So I decided to try. And I, uh, I, as you can probably guess, it was successful, but it was not easy. If I had known then what I know now about how to learn, I could have made it much easier on myself. In fact, if you look at those old textbooks that I have, I, there's all these little dimples in the pages. Where did those dimples come from? I get so frustrated, I take a fork and I'd stab the page, right? Because I couldn't understand what they were trying to say and it almost seemed like the books were purposefully written in a way that made it more difficult to understand. But, but as I began to think, how could I answer that student's question? You know, years later as he posed it, how did I change my brain? I decided, you know, I, I've taught for a number of years in STEM. I, I've, I have perspective on learning from a number of different angles, not just from, uh, from science and technology and engineering and math. Why don't I write a book about it? And so I decided to, I, you know, I like to write books, so I began to write. And as I wrote, ha has anyone here heard of something, probably maybe the Canadians here, uh, called RateMyProfessors.com? <laughs> So I went to RateMyProfessors.com and I picked the top 3,000 professors as teachers who are often great researchers in areas like chemistry, math, uh, engineering, and so forth. And I found their emails and I emailed all of them. And I said, would you be willing to look at the manuscript for my book? And they said, a shocking percentage of them, like more than I'd ever imagined, said, sure. So I got all this input from these top professors from all around the English-speaking world. And one thing really surprised me, and that was that these professors, particularly in STEM, they would use metaphor and analogy to convey ideas in the, in the difficult disciplines they were trying to teach. For example, if they were trying to teach the idea of limits, they might use something like, oh, you have a, uh, a stalker that's creeping closer and closer, but never quite gets to the edge, right? And, but these professors were really shy about revealing the fact that they used these metaphors and analogies, and they were very effective, because other professors often didn't like that they did this. They said, hey, you're dumbing down the materials, you're just making it easy, and so forth. 
But we are now understanding through neural reuse theory, understanding how our brains really work, that when you understand something through metaphor or analogy, you are using the exact same neural circuits you would use to understand the, the in-depth, difficult concept itself. So you're not dumbing things down, you're actually more rapidly onboarding students onto the material if you use metaphor and analogy. So, so this, uh, this was like this shared secret handshake. These top teachers, top professors would often use these same uh, techniques, but they, they were really shy to reveal that they did that. So, so I also reached out to top cognitive psychologists, top neuroscientists, and of course I myself have been teaching for several decades and, and have done research in how we learn effectively. So what I'm going to share with you today are insights from the best of what we know about how we learn effectively. Now the thing is we know that the brain is like really complicated. But fortunately, we can simplify its operation into two fundamentally different modes. And these are completely different networks. It's like here you've got this network here, and then here you've got a, a different network here. And one of those networks is called the focus mode or task positive networks. So this is when you're focusing on something. For example, if you're focusing on me, that's the, the mode or the circuits that are activated. And the second set of networks I'll call the diffuse mode. And diffuse mode is actually a set of, well at least now it's, we, we surmise that it's around a couple dozen different uh, resting states, neural resting states, the most prominent of which is uh, the default mode network. And default mode is kind of like you're not thinking about anything particular. So one is focused, you're focusing. The other one is you're standing in the shower, going for a walk, riding on the bus, so you're relaxed. But I want you to understand these modes just a little bit more and there will be a quiz. So pay attention, all right. Okay, so to understand these modes just a little bit better, we're, we're going to use an analogy. And the analogy we're going to use is that of a pinball machine. So here we go. This is a pinball machine and if you're of a certain age you'll remember that how you play it is you just pull back on the plunger, a ball goes boinking around and it bounces on those rubber bumpers and that's how you get points. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this pinball machine and we're going to insert it directly onto the human brain. So there's our brain and you can see the little nose up at the top and the ears on the sides. And are you ready for it? I'm gonna put the pinball in the brain. Okay, there we go, okay. So this is, this is an analogy for the focused mode of the brain. So focus mode, and you can see how close together these little rubber bumpers are. Now what happens in focus mode, you often have these patterns that have been laid already because you've practiced and learned something. Like I didn't have patterns for multiplication and that was part of the problem. So, so, but you have these patterns and when you think a thought, like let's say I said to you, um, multiply 22 times 43. Well, your thought would take off and it would move smoothly along the patterns that you've already laid about multiplying numbers. But let's say that you're a, a second grader and a third grader, uh, in other words, someone like eight or nine years old, and you're trying to, you know multiplication, but you're just starting to learn division. You've never seen division before. It's kind of like there's this division pattern and it's somewhere else in your brain and you've never even laid it before. You've never gotten to it before. You, know, you have no idea how to get to it. So how do you learn something new? How do you lay brand new patterns about a new concept? The way you usually start is with what you're familiar with. So you're multiplying and yeah, before, and so you've got these patterns, and so you start dividing, and you stick around kind of up in the multiplication part, and you get frustrated because it doesn't work. So you try and try, and you get frustrated, and what happens next? 
When you get super, super frustrated, have you ever noticed that you give up and you walk away? And then when you come back, it, it seems to like suddenly start making more sense. Has anyone ever had that experience? Okay, here's what's happening. When you turn your attention off of, of what you're trying to, to figure out, suddenly that makes room for, it gives you access to that other neural network, the diffuse, the default mode. So the diffuse mode of, of thinking. So notice how in the diffuse mode, you've got these, these rubber bumpers, but they're f much further apart. So when you think a thought, it can range much more widely before it hits a rubber bumper. So in some sense, you, you have longer range connections when you go into diffuse mode. And you can't like solve a precise problem like you can in the focus mode, but you can at least get to sort of a new perspective, a new place in your brain where you can begin to uh, solve the problem. So learning often involves this sort of back and forth between uh, focusing kind of get a little frustrated, then stepping back and letting diffuse mode operate unconsciously in the background. And between those two, that's how you learn effectively. So, so, uh, so if, you, uh, if you're wondering how on earth this kind of thing is ever used in real life, if you look at this guy right here, he is Salvador Dali. He was the original wild and crazy guy. I mean, he was Lady Gaga and Madonna before Lady Gaga and Madonna. Uh, and you can see him, he's got his pet ocelot, Babu. And so, so, but what he used to do when he was trying to solve a problem with this surrealist painting, he'd sit in a chair with a key in his hand. He'd relax away, sort of loosely thinking about what other, whatever problem in his painting he was trying to resolve. Loosely thinking, and just as he'd relax so much that he'd fall asleep, the key would fall from his hands, the clatter would wake him up, and off he'd go. He'd have new insights that he'd gotten while in the diffuse mode, and he'd take it back to the focus mode where he could refine and analyze. So, but some of you may be here thinking, well, that's great if you're a surrealist painter, <laughs> but most of us are not. In fact, many of us work with technology. So I want to also give you an example of another fellow. This was, anybody know? Thomas Edison. Uh -huh. So he was one of the most prolific inventors in history. And what Edison used to like to do when he faced a technological uh, challenge, sit in a chair with ball bearings in his hand. Relax, relax away. Just as he'd fall asleep, ball bearings would fall from his hands, clatter would wake him up, and he'd take the ideas and solutions related to that technical problem from the diffuse mode back to the focus mode where he could refine and analyze. So the lesson for us in all of this is when, we're, when we or our students are learning something new, we often go back and forth between these two modes and, and, and in fact people throughout history have used these two modes for creatively understanding and solving problems and if you're sitting down to solve a problem like 42 times 23 and it's the first time you've done something like that you're using the same creative neurocircuitry that people throughout history have used. So, so it takes time, right? So focusing intently in one session to figure things out is just not going to happen. It's kind of like you, you have to build neural structure with learning uh, just as you have to build some um, muscular structure when you're, when you're doing weightlifting. So cramming at the last minute doesn't work very well. And what I'd like you to do now is I would like you to try. I'd like you to team up with uh, a person or two around you and I would like you to explain to one another what's the difference between focused and diffuse modes. So we have about two minutes for this. On your mark, get set, go. So, 
did you notice what happened when we were, as teachers, when we just did this exercise? Before, you had been focusing on me. Now, you turned your attention to someone else. As soon as you disengaged from me and turned your attention to someone else, during that little time period, what happened? You went into diffuse mode. And in fact, you started paying attention in a different way to what you were learning. This is, this, is a, this is why active learning exercises in the classroom can be so incredibly valuable. It is not only that you are speaking with someone else and getting insights from other people, it's also you are dis you're disengaging from the material and re-engaging with a very different <coughs> perspective and a different set of neural circuitry. So, but I know what you're thinking, okay, us professors, we just love to get up here and we like to give information that's like totally useless, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, because who has time to, uh, you know, back and forth and all this kind of stuff, even though we can do some active learning breaks in the classroom. But there's something else that we do that makes this kind of instruction really, really difficult. In fact, makes any kind of instruction really hard. What is that? Anybody know? Should I? Uh, you're all shy, right? Okay. Procrastination. <laughs> All, I mean, our students are masters of procrastination. And in fact, if you're really honest, you're probably no slouch at doing some procrastination yourself. And procrastination, as it turns out, we, we talk about everything else, how to do good teaching, how to do good uh, 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 deliberate practice, all the good learning strategies, and we leave one thing off the table. And it's the vital thing, and that is that our students procrastinate. So this is so important that I want to talk just a minute or two about procrastination, and I want to give you an effective tool for it. And that is, when we procrastinate, here's what happens, okay? So you start to think about something you don't want to do. And what happens is it activates a portion of the brain, the insular cortex, that experiences pain. So you think about something you don't want to do, it hurts. And so your brain, naturally enough, looks for ways to stop that negative stimulation. So here's the process that happens. So procrastination is just a habit, right? I mean, so just like any habit. And, and how it arises is you, you think about something you don't want to do, you get this kind of unhappy feeling, so you don't feel that good, so you switch your attention to something else, and the result is you feel better almost instantly. <laughs> now you do this once, you do it twice, no big deal. But you do it very often, and it is, it's like an addiction. And it has long-term negative consequences on your life, on the lives of your students. And in fact, they can even think, you know, I can't do this subject at all. At all. I just don't have a talent for it. And it has nothing to do with that at, at whatsoever. It's the fact that they were procrastinating all the time. So now that I am trained as an engineer, I will just immediately jump to the chase. How can you treat, how can you tackle procrastination? And the very best way to do that is using something called the Pomodoro Technique. Has anyone here heard of the Pomodoro Technique? Uh, uh, a few, a few of you, okay. This was invented by an Italian, Francesco Cidillo, in the 1980s. And so, as Arshad mentioned, I teach uh, along with Terry Sanowski, the biggest MOOC in the world. And when I'm hearing back from students, what is one of the things they absolutely find most useful about the whole course? They find several things, but the Pomodoro technique is one that is at the very top of their list of most useful uh, ideas that they've learned. So if you get one thing out of this course, one of the things I'd like it to be the Pomodoro technique. Now the great thing about the Pomodoro technique is like totally easy, right? And its simplicity can almost be deceptive. All you have to do is turn off all distractions. I know you're starting to laugh already, <laughs> but 
But so if your cell phone has a little buzzer or a ringer or whatever, turn it all off. On your computer, those little messages that pop off, in fact, one of the best things you can do for your productivity is turn those messages off. And any kind of way your computer can interrupt you, turn that off. And then you'll just sit there, set a timer for 25 minutes. Now you can download Pomodoro timers uh, onto your cell phone. A lot of people love those. They'll even collect Pomodoros. How many Pomodoro do, do they do in a day? And then you just focus for 25 minutes. So you set a timer. For me, I just have a little timer uh, uh, on my laptop and I just set it for 25 minutes and I, I work intently for 25 minutes. But here, here's the thing. I am all too human, just like almost anybody else. I'll, I'll be working away. I've worked three minutes on my Pomodoro. I look at the timer and I realize I have 22 minutes left to go. <laughs> my mind says, I can't do it. And so I just let that thought go right on by and I continue to work. No matter what distraction, it's all too human to have distractions. But the thing is, during the Pomodoro, you let it go by and then you just return your attention to the task. So then the final critical little key is reward yourself. So at the end of those 25 minutes, do you have a favorite song you really like? Listen to that song. Go to Facebook or get up, walk around, have a cup of coffee, something like that. Give yourself some little thing that you can look forward to at the end of that 25 minutes. And what that does is it kind of wires you so that even during the time you're doing the work, you have this anticipatory pleasure and it makes you feel good. So it takes a while, but after a while you start learning to both focus better and relax better. And here's the mistake people often make in learning. We think we're only learning when we're focusing, but that's not true at all. You've already seen when, when you relax, the, that learning continues to take place in the background. You're just not conscious of it. And so that's part of why these little learning breaks are so important because you're, you're, that, that allows your attention to disengage and for other processes to start manipulating the material in the background. So, so this is part of why the Pomodoro can be so powerful. One little tip is when you sit down to do a Pomodoro, don't focus on actually finishing the task. So don't say, I've got all these homeworks to grade or I've got all this homework to do. I'm going to finish it in, a, in one session here. Your sole goal, remember, if you think about the task, it activates the pain circuits. So you don't want to think about the task, you just want to start doing it. And you don't, so, so don't think about accomplishing a task, just think about, I got 25 minutes to do here. Now you may wonder, why 25 minutes? How did uh, Cirillo come across this? Well, at that time, they didn't have the, this sort of knowledge that we have now about how the brain works. But what, he did know was 25 minutes is slightly less than half an hour. So it seems more doable. And what we now know is that, remember how I told you that pain is activated in the brain when you think about something you don't want to do? Well, you know how long it stays there? 20 minutes. So if you work 25 minutes, you're actually starting to get into the flow where it seems more pleasant rather than that, that painful activity. Now learning, is a, uh, it, it's, being a good learner is kind of like being a great cake baker. There, you can't ask that, that cake baker, you know, what's the best ingredient for baking a good cake? I mean, because there's lots of ingredients to it and you have to t cook it at the right temperature and you've got to be even at the right pressure and so forth. So good learning is, is a lot like uh, great baking. It's got lots of different ingredients to it. So one of those ingredients involves sleep. Now, I know you're, you're like, oh, you know, I already knew that. I knew sleep was important, but you didn't probably know why sleep was important. And because you don't know why, it's easy to fool yourself and it's easy for your students to fool themselves. I've even had for example, recently I saw a doctoral student come in for his qualifying exam with no sleep the night before. Yeah. Well, 
he didn't do very well. <laughs> but, but we have highly intelligent individuals who don't know why they have to sleep, and so it's easy to fool themselves. So why do you have to sleep? If you take a look here, these are my little analogies for neurons. And what happens during the day, as the day goes by, these little metabolites will come out of cells, and they can't, you know, get out of the brain because look these cells are really quite large and they block so that even though fluid can kind of flow past it can't flow very well and what happens though when you go to sleep this, okay watch this okay when you go to sleep your brain cells shrink it's one of my favorite parts why so I have to do this again okay so when you go to sleep your brain cells shrink and then what that does is that allows those fluids to wash the toxins away. So that's a big reason why you want to sleep, but it is not the only reason. In fact, what research is now revealing is this. If you look, there's a, a fantastic new technique called light microscopy. And with this technique, we can image living neurons. So this is an image of a living neuron before learning and before sleep, and here is the exact same neuron, same living neuron after learning and after sleep. If you look at these little yellow triangles right here, those are pointing out places where new synoptic connections are growing or have grown. So sleep is important not just because it washes away toxins, because, but because also that's the time when your brain starts growing that new neural architecture. So this indeed tells you why do you want to, uh, for example, why do you want to uh, space out your learning? Why do you not want to cram your learning all in one day? So, so what happens is, during a night, you can only grow so many new neurons, new synoptic connections. And so because of that, you, you want to do a little bit of learning every day, and you don't want to like do it all in one time because you can only grow so many synoptic connections. So basically, spacing your learning out is what gives you the capability to grow that neuro neural architecture. If you cram, well, it's, you don't grow as effective a neural structure, and in fact, it's easier for those little sort of metabolic vampires to suck away those weak patterns of learning if you've crammed them all in one day. By analogy or by metaphor, if you look, uh, if, you, if you allow time with your learning, so a little bit every day, and then what, what that's equivalent to is that's kind of like you're, you're laying mortar and bricks and you're letting the mortar dry between the layers and if you don't do that the structure looks sort of like this it's a mess and it because you haven't given that mortar time to dry between the layers and you can't have an effective learning structure so there's another aspect of learning that's absolutely critical that i would i would almost guarantee that few or none of you have ever mentioned to your, learn, uh, to your students. And that is, anybody have any ideas? Exercise. Exercise is one of the most important aspects of learning effectively. We used to think that we were born with all of the neurons we ever had in our entire life and as you got older, the neurons would die off and you get kind of stupider and then you die. So it was totally depressing. Fortunately, it was totally wrong. So what really happens is every day in your hippocampus, most particularly, new neurons are being born. Now, it turns out those hippocampal neurons are really important in learning and memory. So wouldn't you want to do whatever you could to help more neurons sprout in your hippocampus, it turns out there is a way to help more neurons sprout and, and to allow them to survive and thrive and grow. And that is two things. First, if you exercise, more neurons will sprout and they'll do okay, but it's almost kind of like they need this, it's like new vines and they need a lattice work to grow with 
And the new growth, that ladder, uh, lattice structure, is learning new things. So if you combine exercise with learning, it's like this, this fertilizer in the brain that helps your brain to work more effectively and to learn more effectively, for sure. And so this, this is kind of a, a, an old paper, and I'm, I'm referring to it on purpose here. So this, in this paper, what they're doing is they're teaching a mouse how to differentiate between these two uh, symbols. And they found that when they allowed the mouse to exercise, that these, these blue blobs represent old neurons, that these red streaks, those are the new neurons, lots of new neurons started sprouting in the, in the mice that were allowed to exercise. And those mice learned a lot more effectively. Now we know a lot more. This is really, there's so much evidence that exercise is an incredibly powerful uh, mechanism to improve your learning. And, but this paper was done by several people, including Terence Sanowski, who is my co-instructor in teaching the MOOC. The, so we, uh, so my husband and I went out to California and we're filming Terry and he's talking about all sorts of things and he's talking about exercise and how important exercise and so I couldn't, I couldn't help but ask him, okay, okay, so, okay, come on, tell me straight. So you talk about exercise. Do you exercise? So Terry's like, do I exercise? Do I exercise? So next thing I know, Here's this guy who's uh, in his late 60s clambering down these cliffs right by the, the Salk Institute. And this is what he, he does every other day or so. He goes out for a run. And I, I, just, I just love how this ends up here. So watch it. Okay, there we go. Oh, yay! <laughs> so, so I'm convinced that part of the reason that Terry is such a legendary neuroscientist is that he walks the walk. He, he not only uh, takes, takes this insight from research and creates this insight from research, he brings it in and uses it to enhance his everyday life, and we can do that too. So, so uh, another ingredient of good learning relates to memory. So we, have, we always used to think that there were sort of if, in short-term memory, so things that you mem or remember for only a short period of time, that you could remember seven things. And so seven slots of working memory. And I always used to look at that and go, man, I don't know who has seven slots, because I, I like don't have seven slots, especially when I haven't had my coffee in the morning yet. But, but now research is showing it's more, it's probably more like four slots in working memory. And those, the, is this a bit of a metaphor? It is, but it's an effective and helpful metaphor. And in learning, all, what you do with metaphors is you use them to boost you to where you need to go. You then throw them away and get a new one whenever that metaphor doesn't work anymore. So the, this metaphor works very well though for what we're doing. So anyway, we know that if we do imaging, uh, the prefrontal cortex, that imaging will show these four slots, or, or show the, when we're thinking about something and using working memory, we can see that the, the prefrontal cortex going crazy. It's really working hard. So if you're holding something in working memory and trying to remember it, we can actually see that on the, uh, in uh, fMRI. And so, what you can kind of, uh, by metaphor, imagine is that when you are, are sort of thinking and try, putting focus, it's almost like this octopus of attention is focusing on the material and it can reach through the slots of working memory and make connections to long-term memory. Now this, by contrast, oh, I should mention that, uh, that when you're uh, kind of watching me, for example, and sort of watching your phone, or like your students are doing in classes, watching one thing but doing a little bit of something else, it's sort of like part of your working memory is blocked off. And so that, 
um, makes you actually less effective. And you are less intelligent when you're dispersing your, your attention in that matter. Now, this contrasts a little bit with diffuse mode where you, you're just randomly making these connections. Now, how do we get something from working memory into long-term memory? So basically, short-term memory into long-term memory. And we now know that the best way to do that is through practice. Practice, in some sense, makes permanent. So what you're doing is the more you practice with material, the more you're laying down these sort of circuits uh, or, or patterns in your brain, and the more you practice, the deeper and richer those patterns can get. Now I had, uh, so I wrote, actually I wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal. I, I was just kind of like, you know, students can sometimes be a little irritating. <laughs> so, so I was like, this student was like, he was a real spark for me. He, he comes up and he says, look at this test. And the test had all this red marking all over it. And he'd flunked the test. He said, how could you flunk me in this test? I understood it when you said it in class. We, as professors, have actually unwittingly given our students the idea that understanding is so important that it trumps everything else. And if they just understand it one, or think they understand it one time, that's it. That's all they need to do. And that practice is not important. So I'm here to tell you that if, if you want your students to become experts in your subject matter, practice is really, really important, especially deliberate practice on the most difficult aspects of the material. It amazes me sometimes that uh, we give out homework and then we get it back from students and they've done a problem one time just to struggle through it. That's like saying, I sang a song once and so I know it. You'd never sing a song or practice a song or practice a, a move with soccer or anything like this and one time and say you knew it. So on homework problems, it's kind of like uh, um, you pick the key ones and you practice it again until you can work it cold in your mind like a song. And we don't teach our students about these kinds of things. So, so one of the other most important aspects of this talk that I'd like to share with you is this, uh, this idea called chunking. Chunking is very well known in the field of neuroscience, but somehow it hasn't gotten out into pedagogy and, that's, um, and, and that needs to change because chunking is such an important part of learning. So what is chunking? If you look here, when you learn something for the first time, right, so you're, you sit down, you're trying to figure something out, and it's like a puzzle. And what's happening is your little working memory is going bonkers, right, trying to figure it out. So then, once you actually figure that puzzle out, what happens is, it's sort of, and you figured it out and you've practiced with it. It's kind of like this, oops, sorry. You have this sort of uh, a, a kind of a, a ribbon that you have brought up into your working memory and notice something really important. So this mad scramble has all simplified and instead it's now just a smooth ribbon, goes up into one, one part of working memory and the other parts of working memory are free. So this is why sometimes a student will come up to you and they'll say, I did really badly on your test. And the reason I did badly is because I suffer from test anxiety. Well, I, I, over the years, I've often, I have my students working in teams. And what I've found is that students who come up and say they suffer from test anxiety are absolutely invariably the ones that are indicated by their teammates as the students who never study and who never participate in homework sessions and so forth. So what these students think is test anxiety is actually the fact that they didn't really understand the material in the first place and then when they're trying to work it on the test, they're in this mode, they're not in this mode and they can't, they can't think creatively with it, they can't actually solve it very easily because they haven't practiced with it. So 
if you have students that have test anxiety, be very, very careful to ask them about what their study habits are because it is in all probability, it, it potentially is real test anxiety, but far more likely it's that their stu study habits are just not very good. So, so the thing is, okay, so this is our younger daughter, right? Now, here's a little known factoid about our massive open online course, Learning How to Learn. Okay, so it is. It's the biggest course in the world, the uh, biggest MOOC in the world, and uh, 1.6 million students registered so far uh, is, is, is really popular, and we did it for less than $5,000. And so uh, you might ask, how on earth did you do a MOOC for less than $5,000? And it's because, well, we did things like using family members for bit parts in the MOOC, right? They're, they were cheap. We'll give you dinner if you... Uh... So, so I needed somebody to model backing up a car really badly. And so, uh, so I tell my kids that. They, they're so used to, you know, uh, what bizarre request is mom going to have next? So my younger daughter goes, yeah. I can, I can do that, Mom. I can back a car up really badly. So what she's doing here is she is recollecting what it felt like to back up a car the first time that she ever backed up a car. And she really did back it up just about the way that you're seeing right here. Notice how her little face is like, uh, oh my goodness, she's like confused. Do I look at the mirror? What do I look at? Wait, wait, which way do I go? And then she backs the wrong way, and now she backs off into the ditch. And uh, um, So that is what backing a car is, feels like when you're, when you're first doing it. It's because your brain is still in that, the working memory, everything is going crazy. You don't have the patterns down. But once you get that idea chunked, all you have to do is think, I'm going to back up a car. And you, it, you've pulled that ribbon up in working memory, and you can even talk to other people, be listening to the, other, to the radio, and it's easy, right? Something that was incredibly difficult before because you've chunked it becomes very easy. So chunking is not just backing up a car, it's also a dance motion, a movement in sports, learning a language, a learning a, in math and science, and we often just don't relate those experiences. So a Anders, uh, Anders Ericsson is the world's ex uh, foremost expert on experts, and what he finds is all experts have these memorized sort of libraries of chunks. They've got these, these uh, patterns in their mind, and they've got these libraries. And the more expertise you have, the bigger your library of chunks, and the, the, the easier uh, you are able to access them. So, so learning effectively often involves building these libraries of chunks. Now, one of the things that we do, uh, to ourselves and to our students is some of the best aspects we have as human beings in, in, in learning and in being creative. We think they are our worst aspects. So one of these is the idea of memory. We think that poor memory is a very bad thing. Don't we? I mean, don't you? Uh, I certainly sometimes feel like, man, I wish my memory was better. And but I am here to tell you that having a poor memory can be a very, very good thing. And why is that? It's because, remember when I told you about those four slots of working memory? Well, if you're like some people, some people are like, they've got steel trap working memories. They, once they hear it, they've got it, right? But other people, they, the, something, something falls out of working memory. It's like, oh, shiny, right? They get distracted. And, but when something falls out of working memory, something else comes into working memory. And that's where the creativity comes from. So when you have a poor working memory, you are in all likelihood more creative. And research has shown this. So do you have to work harder? Do your students have to work harder in order to make up for this? Yeah, you do. 
but you would actually not want to trade it because the, the benefits of having that creativity are really, really terrific. Now there's another thing. Some, some students are slow thinkers. And I mean, have you ever been in a class and you'll ask a question and like there's some student who, he, he has his hand up before you've even finished the last word of the question. They think so fast. And it's like that student has a race car brain. And other students have more like a hiker brain, right? They, they, they get to the same place, but they're a lot slower. But think about the differences this way. A race car brain gets there really fast, but what's their experience? Uh, they hear the air and they see everything whizzing by. The hiker, they can reach out, touch the leaves on the trees, they see the little pathways, they, they can smell the pine air, they hear the birds, completely different experience and in some ways far richer and deeper. Now my hero in science is a fellow by the name of Santiago Ramon y Cajal. He was a Spanish uh, neuroanatomist working in the early 1900s. He's known as the father of modern neuroscience and he won the Nobel Prize for his fantastic work. And what Ramon y Cajal said was, I am no genius. He said, I've worked with many geniuses, but I am no genius. I am here because I, I am persistent and I am flexible in the face of data that tells me I was wrong, so I change. He said, the geniuses that I work with are so used to being right that they jump to conclusions and they're not used to being wrong, so they can't change their mind very easily in the face of data that tells them they're wrong, and it's much more difficult for them to make real breakthrough work. So if your students or even you have kind of a more slow way of thinking about things, there is definitely room for you to contribute in ways that even geniuses cannot. So as we're wrapping up here, uh, oh, I have to say, Miriam Mirzakhani, she won the Fields Medal for her uh, work in mathematics. Uh, it's like the Nobel Prize in mathematics. And she was told as a young person, she thought slowly to ever be a, a, a very good mathematician. And now she's widely acknowledged as one of the most creative mathematicians alive. So again, as we're wrapping up, uh, I'd just like to cover, it's important to recognize that our students fool themselves with the illusions of competence and learning. The best way to get around that is through testing. Have your students test themselves on everything they're trying to learn. If they are looking at a page in front of them, they are fooling themselves that they know it. Because if it's open right there in front of you, you think you know it, and you often do not. So a lot of times, flashcards can be really helpful, not just learning language words, but also in, even in learning math and science. Poets will often tell us, you know, memorize the poem and you will understand it more deeply. But somehow in the West, we've gotten this idea, oh, memorization is bad, it's all bad. And so we don't encourage our students to, to memorize in math and science. Why should we engineering types let all the, the poets have all the fun with memorization? If we have memorization with a few key equations, they think about it more deeply as they're memorizing. Why is that multiplying? Why is that dividing? And we've taken that away from students by giving them sheets with equations and so forth. So, so uh, if, if you do take one thing away from this as far as what's an easy, practical way to learn more effectively from this talk, I would like it to be the idea of recall. Now, what is recall? Recall, they did a really good study uh, which is a lot of back gossip, you know, it was pretty funny. But it, uh, so it was published in Science, and they compared uh, whether you underlined uh, or reread the material, or used something called concept mapping to understand difficult material, or whether you used this technique called recall. Recall means you look at a page. Try to figure out what the key idea, you look away and try to remember and think of what was the key idea of that page. That's 
all. It's a, it's a totally simple technique. When they studied it, they found that this recall technique was far more effective than any other technique, not only at helping students recall the material, but understand the material even weeks later. So if you're trying to learn something difficult, and, you and your students are, have them look at the page, look away, and see what they can recall as far as a key idea. It's a very, very powerful technique. So in closing, I would just like to allude to the idea of passion. We often tell our students, follow your passion. It sounds really good, doesn't it? But here's, passion is a double-edged sword. Passions develop about what we're good at, but some things take much longer to get good at. So don't just follow your passion, broaden your passion, and you and your students' lives will be greatly enriched. Thank you so much.